Welcome back to Talking Dragon Age, the show where I talk about Dragon Age. This episode is about the biggest, nonsensical, headache-inducing, inconsistent perversion of creativity I've ever encountered in a video game, Lyrium. Let's start off here with how Lyrium is used. Much like Vibranium, Lyrium can do whatever the plot wants it to do, but usually it's used by mages to increase their supply of mana. Lyrium connects to the Fate, that much is confirmed. It also connects to the Titans, that is also confirmed. The other main use for Lyrium throughout the series is by Templars. They feel older than they look. They've been changed, and their bodies are incomplete now. The Lyrium helps, but their bodies always want to connect to something older, bigger than they are. That's why they block magic. They reach for that other thing, and magic has no room to come in. Varric feels like that. So do you, except your mark pulls you up. I like traveling with dwarves. Oh, glad to hear it, kid. You're quiet, but the old song still echoes inside, almost like Templars. The song is that of the Titans. The Titans are living parts of the stone. I've long thought of the stone as being the living embodiment of the waking world, the physical side of the veil. Templars block magic by unconsciously reaching for the Titans and the stone, thus reinforcing reality. What is it like when Templars nullify magic, Solas? It is as though you are drawing upon the world around us. Mages draw forth the essence of the Fade, and use that essence to shape reality. And our powers drive it back, making this world harder to affect? In a manner of speaking. You reinforce reality so it is less mutable. The Fade has nowhere to gain a foothold, and the magic disperses. <laughs> no one has ever accused me of reinforcing reality before. You are a seeker of truth. Let's talk more about the Titans. A lot of theories and discussions I've read seem to operate under the assumption that Lyrium is blood. As in, literally, another kind of blood. And maybe. It is the blood of Titans, that much is confirmed. But what I got from that scene is that Lyrium is the Titans' equivalent of blood. Blood gives us life. We cannot live without it, our bodies won't function without it. If we lose too much, we become weak and eventually die. Same thing with the Titans. Lyrium gives them life. They need the function, they'll die if they lose too much. But that doesn't mean Lyrium is literally blood. As in, using it for magic is blood magic. Which, technically it is, yes? It depends on how you want to define blood magic. Let me put it this way. Titans can't exist without Lyrium, but Lyrium can exist without a Titan. Now, I could be wrong about that, but here's my evidence. Lyrium can be found in and around the Deep Roads. Then, going down that elevator in the descent, Volta says this. We've gone past the Deep Roads. How can you tell? It's pitch black. I can feel it. Then combine that with the fact that the Shopper Tall fanatically protect the Titan, but are only found past that elevator. And finally, in the Wellspring, we get this. Ever since we came down here, the deep roads have felt different, organic. Notice that distinction. Only after going down that elevator do things start to feel organic. You could say the Inquisitor is referring to when they first entered the deep roads back at the beginning, but why then would they say things feel different? They would have extremely little to compare to since they've all barely been in the deep roads at all up until the descent. This wouldn't be a problem if they gave us any answers in the descent, but they didn't. Instead, they gave us mugs. But back to Lyrium being considered blood magic. As I understand it, blood mages apparently don't touch the Fade when casting spells. Blood magic operates independently from the Fade. It is shaped all within our world. Lyrium, on the other hand, Lyrium is used to bolster a mage's mana, allowing for more power with which to pull the fade through. In other words, mages aren't shaping the power of Lyrium. Lyrium is helping them pull the fade through into a spell. So if we define blood magic by shaping the power of blood into magic, using Lyrium is still not technically blood magic. But again, I guess it depends on how you want to define it. The point is that it's a legal technicality that probably wouldn't hold up in court. Or maybe that's the only place it would hold up. So, moving on, let's talk about Elvenon. Now would be a good time to put on your tinfoil hats if you haven't already. I was confused for a while. 
The elves fought the titans and mined their bodies for lyrium. I did not understand what they could have possibly needed lyrium for if there was an infinite supply of magic around them. Then I made my episode for blood magic. That's when it hit me. Even without the veil, mages have a finite supply of mana. So having infinite magic around them at all times doesn't really matter if they don't have the mana to utilize it. Mana is the power with which the Fade is manipulated. By using Lyrium, the Ancient Elves would be bolstering their mana and being able to affect the Fade more drastically. So there is that, but I think there's more. Let's take a look at Fenris's markings. According to the world of Thetis, Daenerys learned the practice from an ancient treatise. It wasn't complete, but with some work and research, he was able to fill in the gaps as best he could. Given the style of the markings, they definitely seem elven. Even Meryl recognizes it as Valisleen. Why are you watching me like that? You have Valisleen. The same markings that the Dalish have. Yours are not made of lyrium. No, they're made of blood. Our blood. That's what Valisleen means. Blood writing. It's a mark of adulthood. Mine were carved into my flesh against my will. In a ritual I remember only for the agony it caused me. I'm... so sorry. These grant Fenris unique abilities, such as being able to phase through solid objects at will. He says Daenerys used him as a living battery. They are lyrium, burned into my flesh to provide the power that Daenerys required of his pet. I could totally buy this being done to elves in Elvenon. Either on people wanting the power for themselves, or, like Daenerys, forcing it on slaves. This is one other reason I think Fenris would make an excellent companion in the next game. Exploring the historical application of his markings would be an excellent tie-in to Solus. I should bring up the theory that all the ancient Valisleen was Lyrium as a means of controlling the slaves. But the way Solus talks about them, I, I don't think so. They are slave markings. Or at least they were in the time of ancient Alathan. A noble would mark his slaves to honor the god he worshipped. So, like I said, this was probably done in Elvenon, but not for every slave. Besides, the elves in the Temple of Mithal had normal Valisleen, and they were survivors from Elvenon. I think that's about it for Elvenon. Let's talk more about Lyrium's connection to the dwarves. Now, of course, the first scene that pops into my head is the scene with Dagna after doing a war table operation helping with her research. Every single thing she says here has me drawing all sorts of connections. I've gone over the titans in the past, but we should probably go over some stuff here as well. Dagna was face deep in a rune, and for a moment, she was really tall. And her single thought was all of her people's collective thoughts. And I thought... I thought all the thoughts. <laughs> you felt taller. How much taller? Like, mountain tall. Or, I was the mountain. But I was moving. I, I felt dizzy. You know what I remembered? Watching a shaper it carve the wall of memory. Except, big. And then, in the deep roads during Trespasser, Cole says, Why are dwarves so short but carve their tunnels so tall? Their ancient shapers were mountains drawn of all their wills, walking their memories into valleys of the world. Sounds exactly like what Dagna said to me. Wait. Wait. The, these memory walls. What if the deep roads are arranged exactly like one of these? Except they aren't made of lyrium. So... Well, that's the whole of that theory, so moving on. Cole has plenty of more interesting things to say about this. He also says in the deep roads... It's singing. A they that's an it that's asleep but still making music. A they that's an it certainly sounds like a hive mind to me. And it certainly matches with what Dagna said about how she thought all the thoughts. I don't know. As if for a moment I was around all my people, and my thought was all of theirs. Your thoughts were their thoughts? No, no, my thought was all of our thoughts. Like, parts. Ugh, words are mush. Maybe that's what the stone feels like. Or we think it feels like. If we think it feels. <laughs> Creepy. So what does this have to do with Lyrium? Well, Lyrium is how the dwarves connected to the Titan. Like the Lyrium needs to flow, but if you're part of it, it takes you with it. So you can't be part of it. That makes me sad. I'm not sure why. 
It seems like we should be part of it, whatever it is. Or maybe we're the ones who make it happen, whatever it is. Okay, so if you're still following my train of thought here, kudos to you because I'm lost. But the train keeps going, so we'll follow suit. The stone, still there, silent and reaching up for the blood that walks. No dreams with the cord cut. I like traveling with dwarves. Oh, glad to hear it, kid. You're quiet, but the old song still echoes inside, almost like Templars. Your stories aren't real, but then people read them and they are. Now get the readers invested and you'll have them forever. So many people reading, dreaming, feeling. Spirits spill around the veil, making shapes, reality from writing. I've got fans in the fade. Well, that's something. Shame I'll never meet them. Do you write to reach across? To hear the song that was sundered? I'm not sure what that even means, kid, but uh, probably. So, of course, the song that was sundered is the song of the Titans. He says they feel almost like Templars. That's because, as I went over earlier, the Templars have their own connection to the Titans or the Stone, and that's why they block magic. Moving on from dwarves, we're still not done. Let's talk about Lyrium's connection to the Fade. You see, I was confused for a long time. Lyrium can help strengthen a mage's connection to the Fade, but Templars use it to do just the opposite. How is that possible? It's said Lyrium appears in the Fade as well, but as is the nature of the Fade, I assumed it didn't actually exist, rather it was just a manifestation of imagination. Let's hear what Justice says in Awakening. The version of Lyrium that mortals dream of in the Fade, it is not the same. Here it sings. The sound is something only a spirit could hear, but it summons an ache I didn't know I had. When mortals dream of Lyrium in the Fade, it is not like this. The song saddens me, but it is breathtaking. I assumed he felt this way because Lyrium connects to the Fade, and so he felt more natural, closer to where he belonged, in the Fade. So the idea is that Lyrium connects to the Fade, but not through veins like this. But since we learned that Lyrium is the blood of Titans, well, I had to rethink that assessment. But then I remembered that Lyrium is still Lyrium, no matter what else it is. It's been long established that Lyrium has a connection to the Fade. Many, many sources say it bridges the Fade to the waking world meaning it can go both ways. You have the thing in the middle, you can direct it whichever way you want. Something that comes to mind here are Lyrium Wells. In the The Golems of Amgarag DLC for Origins, we see that these are used to manipulate the environment. We're not sure exactly how. In my episode for The Harvester, I suggest they create a sort of glitch in the veil, either shifting through different levels or allowing certain parts of the fade to creep through. These work independently, as opposed to Templars who have to consciously make the effort to reinforce reality. The Lyrium Wells are mechanical, they're controlled by switches. See, this is where it gets weird. All of this. Basically, the point is that because it connects to both the Fade and the Waking World, it can be used to go either direction. So where are we? Well, I guess miscellaneous. It's worth noting that there is what appears to be a Lyrium Well in the Elven Temple in the Deep Roads during Trespasser. Freaking elves. Go away! There's other stuff I want to see. So we also have Dwarven Runecraft. Specifically, the Codex Entry and Inquisition. We learn a fair bit about the Dwarven Shaper it here. For starters, some of the memories contain the actual thoughts of the Shapers who crafted them. Different runes are used for different things. Memory is, of course, one of the most prominent to the Shaper it. There's more to be said for this entry, but I'll talk more about that in another Dwarven episode. For now, I want to draw your attention to Lyrium's Codex Entry in Origins. For humans and elves, direct contact with Lyrium Ore produces nausea, blistering of the skin, and dementia. Mages cannot even approach unprocessed Lyrium. Doing so is invariably fatal. Okay, well, that is complete bull. Look at this. And this. And this. What? I don't know which one to believe. The gameplay or the Codex? You know, if I was the guy that wrote that entry and I saw that the level designer put that in the game, I'd have gone to him and said, hey, this doesn't make sense, you've got to take it out. And if he told me, nah, it's fine, don't worry about it, I'd have taken it to the project director 
and if he said, nah, it's fine, don't worry about it, I would have gone into the files and edited the entry to read, doing so is invariably fatal, except when it isn't. And if they got mad at me, I would have gone, hey, you guys are the ones who didn't care if it made sense, so I went the extra mile and I fixed it. You're welcome. And I feel the need to say this. I'm joking. This isn't a big deal. Mistakes happen, and this one is relatively minor. But as I've said before, and will no doubt say again, one of my biggest pet peeves is when gameplay doesn't match the lore. Because now I don't know which one to believe. Especially since you get this entry by interacting with Lyrium. They took that out of future Codex entries, so does that make this a retcon? I mean, it's in the same game. I don't know, I'm done. Alright, I think we're finally ready to start wrapping this up. So let's recap. So, Templars use Lyrium to reinforce reality by reaching for the Titans. Dwarves are not connected to the Titans, but they used to be, and the old song still echoes inside them. On the other end of the spectrum, we have mages. Mages use Lyrium to bolster their mana, which is how they manipulate the Fade. That's also most likely how it was used in the days of Elvenon. More Lyrium means more mana, and more mana means more magical power. Dwarves have other uses of Lyrium. For one, runes. Different dwarven symbols carved with Lyrium cause different effects. They're placed on weapons to grant special magical properties. They're also used by the Shaperit to store memories. They also have Lyrium wells, which work independently and can exert power over the veil. They're not commonplace in modern dwarven society, though. I think the lesson to take away from this is that mages are not needed to make Lyrium do magic. Lyrium is, in itself, magic. And while they're sometimes inconsistent about it, they are correct in that it does cause headaches. Is there anything else? Yeah, probably. But for now, I think that's it for now, guys. Thank you all so much for watching, and remember, Tala Nadas. Mm -hmm.